Welcome to my basement, everybody. Boy, do we have something special today. This is a podcast celebrating the intersection between movies and video games, all to kind of spotlight the release of the new Ryan Reynolds movie called Free Guy. And the co-screenwriter of Free Guy joins us today. His name is Zach Penn, who has been a part of Hollywood since Last Action Hero. He worked on Men in Black and the X-Men movies. And his friend, who also collaborated on Free Guy, is Mike Micah, who is the studio head of Digital Eclipse. He's got dozens of great games on his resume, including the Samurai Showdown Neo Geo Collection, that medieval remake from 2019, Lots of classic retro experiences that have been brought back into modern consoles. He's a wonderful guy. So Mike Micah and Zach Penn join me in the basement today. And today's episode, as always, is brought to you by The Gaming Stadium. They are Canada's leader in online esports tournament facilitation. They have got tournaments happening every single weekend, so make sure you check them out at tgs.gg. Welcome to my basement, everybody. I am joined by my old friend, Mike Micah, and also a special guest, Zach Penn, who is the co-screenwriter on the new film, Free Guy. And what's cool about Free Guy is that my buddy, Mike, from the video game industry that has worked on countless games, also contributed to this movie. And I, I want to know how that happened. How did you two meet, first of all? Why don't we start with Zach? How did you guys meet? Well... I was making a documentary about the fall of Atari um, yep. and about the burial of the ET video games. And part of that included um, going out to the desert in Alamogordo and actually digging up the fabled games. Uh, this was, I guess, 2013 or something when I started. And one of the people that I, I don't remember how many different people recommended Mike, <laughs> but one of the people that we decided to follow for the movie was Mike, um, just because we knew he was interested in it. And then, you know, we became fast friends and he ended up playing a very big role in the movie. Um, so that's where it started. And then I was actually working on Ready Player One at that point and with Ernie Klein, and it just became natural to bring Mike in as a consultant on that movie. And then when Free Guy came along, I said, is, you know anyone who's like an expert in game history who you know can talk to us and i was like there's only one person so yeah <laughs> you know it like uh i was gonna say like when you go to the desert with somebody like zach and you get like that stuff all up your nose and you smell that garbage for like three days or where it was or out there it's like you're you're bound you're bound for life to travel with this guy wherever <laughs> we're brothers man we're brothers, brothers. we exchange blood and get all the things that brothers do <laughs> and whatever else was in that pit <laughs> It came to us. <laughs> Brothers in uh, buried silicon right there, which is yeah, so yeah. Uh, fantastic. In dusty um, garbage. <laughs> it, it, when you reached out to Mike, did you have a feeling that he would have like the treasure map, that he would know exactly where everything was with that stuff? We were in pursuit of that thing for a while, too. I think like Zach had done so much kind of awesome homework on where these things were. He found where the bodies were buried and it was just a matter of getting there and also bringing a few extra players. And so when he was bouncing back and forth, when I came on, Zach, it was pretty funny. We'll get into Free Guy in a minute, but this, this documentary was so interesting to me because like, uh, it originally started out as being like a mockumentary and Zach found a story in it that was way better than what sure. the original goals of the documentary would be. So by the time I came on and hearing where Zach wanted to take it and what he wanted to do with it, it was like, it was exceptional in that but if you've seen it you'll see that it's this awesome redemption story that it almost wasn't going to be that's yeah. amazing and, and let me clarify a whole bunch of other people did all that research i mean they hired me part of the reason why it was going to be a mockumentary is we were worried it was going to turn into geraldo <laughs> rivera and yeah, right Paul. and <laughs> they hired me because they had seen this movie i did incident at loch ness which is a mockumentary and they just wanted to have a backup in the likely chance that we found nothing so, right. um, you know, a lot of things came together, but um, also we interviewed a bunch of people and the people who had interesting stories, you know, are the people who took over the, the documentary, which is what yeah. always happens. And that's why Mike, you know, wasn't, <laughs> wasn't trying to get what? free games from him. <laughs> I still owe you two. I know. <laughs> the the three of us are of an age that, ha you know, we've obviously grown up with games around us. Um, Mike, I have some semblance of idea of uh, what video games mean to you, but Zach, your career has kind of floated in and around video games almost from, from the early days. I, yeah. I want to know what video games mean to you. 
Well, here's, I mean, I am a, I'm a gamer and have been a gamer since I was, my dad brought Pong home, which must've been when I was five or six. Um, So, you know, I'm as old school as you can be as a kid growing up with games. And, you know, honestly, my interest in games has very little to do with my career in Hollywood. It just Mm -hmm. so happens that as as I, you know, got to the business and grew older, the types of subjects that gaming is usually centered around became more and more popular. And (laughs) so and then people started uh, doing even more adaptations of video games. Obviously, there had been some like Mario Brothers before I got to Hollywood. But, you know, then I became, uh, you know, a guy people went to to adapt video games, which I almost never I don't know that I ever done that because I don't think that's a good I think the two art forms are extremely different and the experiences are different but Mm -hmm. I also used once I got to Hollywood and had some leverage I wanted to work on games and it was actually harder to get into games than I thought it would be people just but I got to work on them because people wanted the screenwriter from the film to work on the game so that's how I ended up learning about it um that's and, and a little bit by us, you know, Steven Spielberg is a, is an old as old school a gamer. I mean, he started gaming sure. as soon as he developed. So that also led to some, you know, interesting contacts in the business. We are living in an era where it feels like the Oasis is becoming reality before our eyes. Was was that something that you tapped into when you got to meet uh, and, st- and start working with Ernie Klein? Did you have that kind of realization too that we were heading towards this or did it all feel like science fiction back then? Uh, I'd like to say that I had that realization, but so many other people had already had that realization. I mean, um, at Oculus, I think they handed out uh, Ready Player One to everyone before I even made this Atari documentary, much less came on to Ready Player One. So yeah. uh, that's one of those books that the second it came out, people were talking about, this is a vision of the future that feels accurate, you know, that feels like yeah. this is where we're headed. Um, that said, you know, even while we we're doing the research on that, you know, on that movie, there was all sorts of stuff. Even in 2015, I remember it was like, yeah, not only is it might it come, but it's already here. You know, there's already sure. people doing this stuff. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's one of the things I think made it such a phenomenon. The book is that, you know, like Snow Crash, you know, it it had a vision of the future that really struck people, you know. So, um, but I mean, actually, to me, you know, and it speaks to what about, you know, telling stories. uh, One of the things is, you know, stories have nothing to do with the experience of game playing, right? Like, Mm -hmm. you know, game playing is all about you controlling the world you're in. So for me, it was more that Ready Player One had a really strong story at the center of it that was worth adapting, you know? Totally. Yeah. So, um, which is not often true with video game adaptations, you know? Um, I actually think, that's why Free Guy, you know, both Mike and I, I think we have very similar tastes in this way. Making a movie in which video games are par- and gamers are part of the fabric of the movie works as well as making lawyers or doctors or superheroes sure, sure. part of the movie. You know, that it's, it's a culture that's interesting to depict. It's just when you try to capture the feeling of a video game in a movie, that's where I think you really people go wrong because you know it's just i i remember reading the doom script and getting some and no offense to whoever wrote this but getting some point and said and now we go into doom vision first person shooter vision <laughs> something you've never seen before and, and and it goes into great lengths and i was like this is a pov shot it basically yeah. a POV shot. <laughs> yeah. that, we've seen it all our lives yeah that's that, you know that's the problem. Like the audience isn't controlling the character. So yeah. Um, I don't know where I was going with that. <laughs> no, no, it's, it, it's all illuminating. Mike, I want to know what, you know, you run digital eclipse and you have people that you work with all day and congratulations on all of the, uh, the new investment that's been going on with your company. I think yeah. that's phenomenal, but you. I, you know, you're, you're working alongside colleagues now and you have over multiple years at this point that are in, in a, uh, 
uh, an industry, if it's not more sophisticated, at least it's been around a lot longer. And there's a lot I would imagine you may be learning from processes and, and the way that people work together. Are you implementing any of that into the way that you're building out your studio? Yeah, you know what, it's it's one of these things right now where, uh, you know, before we got on, we were talking a little bit about this, where techno film and game technology are merging together. You have Epic with Unreal that is now spread across both worlds. And yeah. we're using the same tools to tell stories, same tools to build worlds. And, and it's just getting closer and closer to, to, to being like a very unified entertainment kind of group rather than just being what we've always seen for many years, these very separate Kind of worlds like if we were working on a game say say we we're working on a free guy game and you know we would probably get the call like three months ago saying hey the movie is going to be out in a few months can you make a whole game like <laughs> and get it out yeah. in time that's going to be triple a 90 percent on uh, metacritic it's like we get those kind of calls all the time but now we're being more involved we're involved more at the very beginning of an idea because mm -hmm. we're also playing a role now we've got two other projects going on in the studio where we're playing a role in helping build the world itself for the film as mm. well as like planning on doing an interactive um, aspect of this. And the interactive side is not going to be just the, oh, here's a bunch of mini games in the world anymore. It's, it's actually, okay, we're going to create an experience because when somebody goes to the movie, like say when you go see Star Wars and you go to Galaxy's Edge at Disneyland, you just sure. want that extension and, and live and breathe in that world. Well, now you can do that because the whole world's been built and you can walk into that now. So and, what is the experience going to be there? And then talk about like the perfect kind of intersection of filmed entertainment and video game technology and location based kind of content all sort of meeting. And, you know, both of you guys can answer this, but I'll throw this to Zach. Do you feel like consumers now, people that love entertainment, don't make those barriers, don't put up those distinctions? They travel from one piece of entertainment wherever, whatever screen they might enjoy it on to another. And it all is part of Grist for the Mill. Um, honestly, no. I actually mm. don't think I actually think what Mike is hitting on is where the confluence is really occurring, which is mm. Ready Player One. We were using video game engines and we were using the same techniques that are used for video games with motion capture, for example. We are using them in the same way that video games do to create their world. But yes. the big distinction that's that's, you know, sometimes missed, particularly by people on the film side, is that the experience of playing a game is almost, you know, if you try to make a game feel just like the movie, the problem you're going to have is that you, I don't know, I don't want to play a game where I'm a passive participant in the story. And so gameplay is still hugely important. It's still central to the experience. And you'd be surprised how many meetings I've had with people who, you know, claim to be huge gamers and they talk about, you know, oh, I just want it to be like the movie. I'm like, well, slow down. The game designers really have, they have to create their own world and, and that's just as important. And when I say the world, the world building should be consistent. And by the way, that's always should have been consistent. And I, I have yeah. a funny anecdote I can come back to about <laughs> having this discussion with Steven Spielberg about um, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. But uh maybe i should just tell that which yeah quickly, you know, i was Please. in college you can't leave it hanging like that <laughs> yeah. yeah i know i realized it's a podcast i can't i can't do that um when i was in college i played the side scrolling uh temple of doom you know stand up arcade game all the time back before you know i mean we had consoles but you couldn't play something that looked that good it always looked better in the arcade and was more sure. fun to play and when i was playing it i noticed that if you, I can't remember if you went to the left or the right in the mine tunnels, that it seemed like that was the right path. And so then I started to wonder, I remember the Prince of Pankot saying, Indy, stay to the left or stay to the right, whatever it was. And yeah, so I yeah. went and rented, this is, you know, I went to college back when we, there were blockbusters. Uh, I went and rented the Temple of Doom to see if it matched up with the game. And it seemed to, it seemed to be something that the designers had taken from the game cut to three years later i get to hollywood three years after that i finally get to meet steven spielberg you know early in my career i think i was working on ants at the time and uh i i was so i was like steven i gotta ask you this <laughs> was it intentional was that a bit? and he said oh my god i wish it was i'm always trying to get them to do that to make if you know the movie that the game you have secrets to the game you know and right, right it's that's one thing that 
that is how games to me that is how games and movies should intersect is that the the world should inform each other there should it's be an extension yeah right there should be an extension and it should make the gameplay better not stall it out for a cutscene, in my opinion um right so right. yeah i agree with that because the venn diagram there's there's the the building of the world that we can all share but then the way you tell a story in each area is very different and particularly because zach hit on it like when you're playing a game, it's your story, basically. You're invested in, you're, you're, you're contributing to that storytelling. And that's something that you can't do in film the same way. And there's going to be a lot of like weird mixes of those two things. But ultimately, mm-hmm. at the end of the day, you can have a better experience that extends beyond the film and also extends beyond the game by, by contributing to one another as you're, you're growing that world out. So those like kind of side quests that you'd have in a game could be things that happen in the film and vice versa, things that the film kind of alludes to when you see something where... I just watched Gunpowder Milkshake and there's a moment where one of the characters whispers in the other character's ear and you have no idea what they said. If that moved over to some sort of game aspect that was a supportive element of that whole world and that what was what happened there carried over to that, that would be amazing because now you're in both of the, those sections of that world exploring yeah. this like greater universe of what that is. That's awesome. Yeah, I like that a lot. Well, let's talk about, um, you know, the the creation of Free Guy. Uh, let's start at the beginning. How did How did the Free Guy concept come to be? Well, first of all, the spec script was written by a guy named Matt Lieberman, who mm-hmm. is the, you know, I am credited with. We are co-writers. Um, I, I don't want to, you know, it's a big thing for me, particularly given my career, like someone who sits there and stares at the page and comes up with the concept deserves, a, you know, most of the credit. So uh, I was basically hired, you know, they were in development and they were thinking about green lighting the movie and there were a couple of things that they, you know, this is how I get hired often um, when I don't write an original, you know, they came to me and said, can you read this? We know you're probably not going to want to do it because you just did ready player one, but yeah. check it out. And first of all, I was like, this is actually nothing. I know it seems like ready player one. I know it's going to get compared to ready player one, but it's entirely different. I mean, it's just, it couldn't be more different. Free guy is about a, fictional character in a fictional world discovering you know who he really is and his purpose you know ready player one is a futuristic you know thriller with human characters at the center of it you know yeah so so free guy sounds a little bit more like ready player two yeah well (laughs) uh no but but even (laughs) look when you write a movie where the character where ryan's character is you know unique and special and isn't really human right like yeah. that and the story has a different type of adventure to it so so i was like yeah i'll read it and then also i had as soon as i read it i had a bunch of ideas about you know uh changing stuff and fixing stuff but just to skip to the more important part you know sean and i and ryan had some intense discussions about what we were going to do and then sean and i basically hold up at my place um uh, with my assistant, Danny, who ended up, I think she's in the movie and did an incredible job. Um, cool. We basically did this quick, you know, I, I did a quick rewrite of the movie and then they decided to make it. And so one, and that would happen very fast. And so once that happened, I said, okay, you know, when you do a rewrite, you're often like, all right, we'll come back and figure out the accurate version of this later. We know it needs to go from here to here. And there's a lot of stuff about indie games and there's a lot of stuff about mainstream games and there's a lot of theoretical stuff about games. So I had to call Mike, you know, that was, that was probably the next call. I, you know, I mean, I I think it was very early on in the process that Mike came in to. That was, that was one of those great calls where like Zach calls me up and he, he kind of just like, and it, you're seeing Zach now. And you, when you get to know Zach, Zach just tells you everything like it is like, here's exactly where this is. <laughs> here's what, here's what I see is kind of these issues. And then he also does the thing where he's like, I don't want to tell you or make you have any preconception either. So you read it. I want to hear your raw thoughts. And it's like that. So it's like one of these things where when I got it, it was funny because I, I started to read it. And I'm like, is this going to be like a ready player one thing? And then it dawned on me really quick. One, it's a great story. The story was fantastic. Yeah. Forget everything else. Cool. It was a very different story. As Zach said, and, and the other part of it is the idea that, like, I hate when people say, oh, a video game movie, like, that's a story in and of itself. Right. Because people group video game movies up together. And stuff, sure and, like, I love the idea that this was, it had so much heart and it was going in a very different place that in my mind, like, this is another step towards, like, 
forget calling these things video game movies. It's just, we all grew up with video games. Video games are our life. So that's just a background element of what this is. And we want to get it right. We want to do all these cool things about it, make sure that we don't take people out of the fiction by do, getting something wrong. So then I like, I kind of went through it and like Zach was just saying like, anything that seems weird, just let me know. In fact, he was like, rewrite something your way so I can see what you're in your head, what, what's wrong with that. And Wild then like, man. so I would do that and it's an over and it's like, Zach would turn back something that was just like, oh, that's, wow, that's why you're a screenwriter. Because <laughs> it's like, I had all these little technical problems with something and he would just like turn that into like this really good kind of like moment in, in the script that was just like, yes. And then in my mind, I'm like, finally we're over this hunt because I see so many movies where I can't watch the movie and yeah, I make games, I do all this stuff, but it's hard to watch the movie when everything's so wrong. Even like oh, yeah. Captain totally. Marvel had a Street Fighter machine with a 16.9 monitor in the 1990s. Yes. <laughs> yes. I'm like, ah, yeah. you're ruining my experience in this movie. Oh, like man. my brain yeah. can't let go of that. That's <laughs> when I walked out too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it's it's that old Pac-Man sound that we've heard from the 2600 Pac-Man sound. How many movies have we heard that damn sound? Effect in, and you know? playing over like doom <laughs> I know. <laughs> even right <laughs> it's so bad okay well there's there's uh there's one thing where it's a it, it can be construed as a video game movie or it can be construed as something like ready player one i want to talk to you guys a little bit about the uh, uh almost tron blade runner-esque qualities of ready player uh, one sort of infiltrating all kinds of other media now too right like we just saw the new space jam movie get compared to like i think we're gonna have a lot of stuff get compared to ready player one from now on uh, but there's also the Ryan Reynolds equation. And 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 so I feel like this, just seeing the marketing, it's like it's a Ryan Reynolds movie. It's a video game movie. And, uh, you know, it's an it's a conventional sort of action comedy type thing. Did, did it change a lot when Ryan was attached to it or did it kind well, of just flow? Yeah, well, first of all, I think the spec was written, obviously, without Ryan. But Ryan came aboard the movie way before I did. I mean, he was one of the first people attached to it. I think, I believe he was involved in it the whole way. And you could tell because there are certain, uh, you know, speeches or sequences that were so Ryan that you knew that Ryan had written them, you know, and I right, think right. he did do some writing on the movie. Um, I mean, Ryan's an excellent writer. He also is, one of the things he's really great at is, you know, we had to talk about who's really the main character of this story, you know, right. which, I mean, obviously, Ryan is the dominant character and he's, you know, what everyone is coming to see. And he carries a lot of the movie. But really, the main character is Millie. And, you know, that was kind of a shift in the script, which was figuring out what's the human POV on this story? Who's our way into this world? Because Ryan is obviously playing guy, you know, is is someone that is living in a completely he, I mean, he is not a real person right and he's living yeah. in a world that's not real so uh one of the things that was great was that you know ryan had zero ego about that he was like you're absolutely right uh we need to service her story the jokes will come we'll figure all that out um and th so you know it was always a ryan reynolds movie and it was always designed to serve ryan i do think one of the great things that came out of it i mean i really you know, everybody always says, oh, you know, what's so great about this movie. And, you know, it's just because you're selling it. But I genuinely believe that one of the really great bits of kismet about this is that Sean Levy has a very, very, you know, like an excellent sense for emotion in movies and an excellent sense for warmth and and, you know, making something that is you know, that where you really understand the characters. Ryan has got an outrageous sense of humor. You know, my sense of humor is pretty close to Ryan's. Like I like stuff that's pretty dark and messed up. And, <laughs> but at the same time, my job is story. And so what happened with the three of us, I think, is that Guy is not your conventional Ryan Reynolds character. And in, in my opinion, I don't know how you felt about the movie, but he is... It's Ryan channeling his sense of humor into a character who's so appealingly innocent and so and is the butt of the joke most of the time. You know, Deadpool is the exact opposite, right? Deadpool right. is always the one mocking. He's mocking you. He's mocking the audience, which is partly what makes it so good. <laughs> That's Free Guy is a much. I, mean, I remember seeing the first cut and thinking, wow, this movie is so emotional. It's so much. You know, there, there's something so endearing about his performance in this movie. And 
I think if you'd said to him up front, we're going to make the most endearing movie you ever made, Ryan, I think he'd be like, ooh, that sounds like it's not going to be funny at all. <laughs> but that's the thing. I think this is one of those times where, you know, like Elf is the comparison I use most often. Sure, where sure. It mm. still feels like a Will Ferrell movie, but it's also more than that, you know? Um, yeah. So, so it's been Ryan all along. So it never, you know, that never changed. But the idea of saying, well, okay, it's Ryan and it should have a sense of humor, but how do we do that and still keep the central story of the movie, which is about an innocent guy, right? I mean, that's who, who doesn't understand the world around him. So, you know, that became the challenge and the fun of it, you know, so. That's awesome. Yeah. Mike, it, this, this seems like an excellent idea for a game as well. <laughs> the idea of one of the background characters sort of becoming self-aware and then the camera and the perspective shifts on them. Was that ever a discussion? Were you ever talking about this as a potential spin-off video game experience? No, you know, it never, this is the, this is the really weird part is it never really crossed my mind because this was really about this story. And, and it really was about um, like this, this unique thing that I don't think a video king could tell this kind of story mm. effectively. And so I didn't want to be, the guy making the weird side game that's like, look, you can like shoot cars or whatever as they go by and do stuff and try to capture the 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 visual kind of like fireworks of the movie and not capture the heart. Like that isn't yeah. what would serve this well. I think there are games that would serve this well that would need more time. And I think after this movie comes out, I think people need to see it and understand this world to know where that kind of go. But if you tried to like preempt this and a game came out like tomorrow before the movie and people are playing this, they would have it would have a complete disconnect. And this kind of goes back to some of the other things we we're talking about. It's like, it's just not the right thing to have the movie uh, and the game kind of come together like that. Not yet. It's getting there, but I don't think this was, this was ready yet. This is paving the way. Right. And also a lot of the movie is about people playing games, you know, like, yeah, if you imagine how confusing it would be <laughs> if you tried to mirror Millie's experience in this story, yeah, so you're a gamer, because that's what you're already doing. You're, I mean, Millie is literally, that's why this is a movie about gaming. That's why it was so important. The authenticity and bringing in all these actual gamers is because it's about people who not only design games, they play games. So that would be, I don't, basically what would make it like the movie is if you played Free City, right? I mean, that. that exactly. And, and it does speak to another thing, which is, you know, and this is something Mike and I talked about, I think in our first conversation, this isn't supposed, Free City is not the best game. Yeah. It's not. It's not like Grand Theft Auto where it's groundbreaking and everybody loves it and it wins all the awards. That's not what's going on here. And that, to me, also let it be so much more realistic and so much funnier, frankly. Talk to me about the, uh, you know, Zach, you've known about the video game industry. You've worked alongside it. You've dug into it. But, you know, was there something about working on Free Guy that helped you see another side of the video game industry that that uh, you learned this time? Maybe it, it was something about working with Mike. Um, let me think about that. I mean, obviously, I've been pretty immersed. I mean, having written a couple of games and having, you know, I actually tried to get someone to let me design, you know, to help create a game. But that was really hard. Just as, it was like as hard as selling a movie idea. Um, you know, I think one thing that definitely happened was Mike really updated me on, you know, the difference between, you know, where indie games were now and the type and kind of not just retro gaming, but, you know, Mike, Mike obviously makes these games that are, uh, you know, that are designed to be more contained and not a sprawling AAA 60 million or whatever, I don't know, 160 million, whatever <laughs> games these days. Uh, yeah. And, and that I knew that some of that, you know, I knew it because I have the consoles, so I've seen some, mm -hmm. but I didn't mm -hmm. realize how vast that world was and how many different types of games. And Mike showed me a lot of stuff that really, you know, uh, blew my mind. But also it got very technical in this, as opposed to in Ready Player One, which is not about, the, it's not at all about the technology of how this world is created, right? I mean, there's no. a lot of stuff about the stuff you wear, but in this, it is very much about how games are designed and what, you know, very specific stuff. You know, often Mike would say something and I felt like, you know, I'd be like, oh, right, that makes total sense. And everyone's like, 
what's Mike talking about? You know, <laughs> I don't understand what he's saying. And it's just because I've spent a lot of time around game you know, designers that I knew. Um, but yeah, there was plenty of stuff. And, and even just in terms of the problems that, you know, come up with games and the tech support and, you know, yeah. things that might sound really boring to other people, but for, as a writer, you are often looking for those things that make a world feel real other rather than it's easy to come up with the exciting stuff. It's the, it's the details of this is what would be real if it happened. Those right. are the things that were very exciting. And obviously Mike, you know, was filled with them. And, and I will say a lot of it has to do with Mike knows movies and he's, you know, worked on movies and he knows games. So he's fluent in both of those. Cause quite often when you bring an expert in, like, you know, I'm the thing I'm working on the show I'm working on now, we talk to a lot of astrophysicists and a lot of astronauts and stuff, cause it's set in space. And, you know, they just tell you here, no, that doesn't, that would never work. I'm like, I know it would never work because this is science fiction, but what's close to it? And they're like, well, it wouldn't because of this, this, and this. And then you're like, <laughs> and he's talking to you. You know, Mike's never like that. He's like, I get what you're after. Let me show you some examples of how, of the real version of that, which, yeah. you know, anyway. So th that was probably, there was a lot of that on this movie. Um, did, but remember, I had spent two years picking his brain before this. So, you know, <laughs> But we went to new we went to new depths with this too because it was really interesting to me because at the beginning we did a lot of show and tell. There was like here's these story beats that we feel are really strong for the story and they, they have to happen. But there were things that weren't quite getting them there technically. And because these characters are game developers, their motivations are wrapped in with the technical aspects. Like what what makes them upset if something doesn't work right or whatever? Like what is that? And so we had to really mine for those things. And like throughout the the production of the movie, I, my most interaction at the beginning was with Zach. And then during the um, production of it, I had two people I'd get calls from, which would be Sean and then the production designer, Ethan Tobman, who would always run things by going like, okay, here's what's in here. We set this thing up and it's like, oh, the monitor's upside down or whatever, you know, it's like, or whatever. It's like these things, that, those are the little things. But then there was all about the motivation for, for the characters or the, the what was going on. Why would people be in a certain area and that sort of thing. That blew my mind because I think that's where a lot of movies fall short is when they get to that moment. Like you can set up the story and stuff, but then when they actually, when the when the you know rubber hits the road, they start doing stuff. They start to improvise on set and do all these sorts of things, and that's where it kind of breaks down. So it's like we need a street fighter, put a street fighter over there, and it's like it's a street fighter. But in this case, everybody had it in the top of mind uh, from the very beginning of like, okay, how what's the real thing here? Because if this character is going to be realistic, what's around them has to be realistic, and what sure. are they engaging with has to be realistic, which is amazing to me. Did you guys have a uh, a specific character that you had to offload? the most you know game development jargon on <laughs> and they had, they had to look at yes. you know super authentic <laughs> who, who was that was that taika watiti or who was it no no i would say it's joe Curie's character i mean it's oh, joe cool. and jody comer's characters are the ones and you know to an extent utkarsh's character as well mouser and keys but yeah. really yeah. uh you know this is just uh, you know I, I realize you haven't seen the movie yet but i think I don't want to say the unsung hero because Joe's a pretty popular actor and it's not like he doesn't have, he has a lot <laughs> to do in the movie, but yeah. I was pretty astounded at how able he was. He took very technical language that's very expositional. That was hard not to make expositional because it was about code and AI and other things like that. And he, it's just, those scenes are seamless. I mean, I told him this when I saw him, I'm like, you made every scene I was worried about because I thought this is going to look bad for the writers. Yeah. He nailed. And he is the one that, and that's the thing. He sounds authentic, you know, he like does. he sounds like he yeah. really knows this stuff. And that, that guy blew me away on uh, last season of stranger things. Like he is just an incredible young actor. Yeah, He really is. And I, yeah. and this is a different, you know, delivering exposition in a big, Hollywood summer movie is not it, it's very it's difficult I mean a lot of yeah. stars have trouble with it and it's it's always hard to you're desperate to try to write it in a way so it doesn't feel like exposition and still you end up with a couple of scenes where you need some you know you need to explain yeah. to the audience something they don't understand and when you see this movie I think you'll see what I'm talking about which is 
you cannot listen to the words and still get what's happening in the scene because of Joe and Jody's performance, you know? And, That's awesome. and so, um, yeah, and there's a lot of technical stuff in the movie. And obviously we have a lot of real gamers, you know, popular gamers who I assume, you know, I wasn't there for every recording session, but they're probably saying what feel, you know, I would give them some, here's what it should sound like, but, you decide on the technical aspects of it or Sean ask Mike and he will tell you <laughs> what the technical aspects of it. Cause I, I'm not like, I'm not a competitive gamer. I mean, I play online a lot, but I'm not, you know, I don't, I don't have people streaming my, you know, game tips or anything. So, and I don't stream yeah. game playing. So it was, it's a funny, a quick aside was like early on, I thought it was a, a funny epiphany. I was on the phone with Zach and I had just read the script and we kind of almost at the same moment we had the realization of like you know what there are no streamers or or, or that in this script yet mm. it was like one of those things where it's like oh there's this, the outside world kind of stuff that like we're so used to it was like that was the the beginning where zach went back and just like leveled it up completely where it's like we because cool. we were so immersed in this stuff all the time you almost forget about what that is that was the, the big like wake up moment at least for me was like, oh, don't be so comfortable with what we just take, what we see every day as whatever it is. This is, we got to insert that in here as if that's just the everyday and what it is with this. Yeah, right. the iteration and, is something to, to really kind of lock in on, right? Well, yeah. Also, one of the things that's really important in this movie is who's streaming what? Like, yeah. how are people seeing this is not, you know, in Ready Player One, we have a, you know, there's a moment like that where it has to be covered you know, the way we covered it is literally just exposition explaining, oh, so-and-so is broadcasting this, but that's right. not necessary anymore. You know, like the, yeah. <laughs> and it's certainly not necessary in this world because people are broadcasting stuff and, and the, the it, the, yeah. And it, it is absolutely a plot point in the movie. It's who's streaming, what, who is showing their feed to other people, um, who the people commenting are, you know, the, 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 the actual people, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, Ninja or Jacksepticeye or whoever. And by the way, my kids were really helpful at that. I have teenagers <laughs> and my teenage boys were like, oh yeah, this guy, that guy. And, you know, I don't play Fortnite. And they told me all about Fortnite. you know, I watched them play Fortnite a bunch of times. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's, I think fans will see. I think that's why we've gotten a lot of positive response from actual gamers is that, it's not just like, oh, uh, turn on the magic streaming device that streams <laughs> everything to everyone everywhere. You know, yeah. you, you really, and Sean, as the movie went on, I mean, one of the things I noticed with the last cut of the movie, you know, the final cut, because, you know, as you know, because of COVID, I saw a cut of this movie over a year ago and right, right. a number of cuts. <laughs> but you'll see in the final movie, well, you won't see because it'll seem to you like it was always there, but. Sean kept adding more and more cutaways to actual gamers and people watching gamers and the people sitting next to gamers, you know, um, some of which is in the trailer. But but that, as Mike said, the authenticity of the movie. Also, I would say the storytelling of the movie was elevated yeah. for that because suddenly you have this whole different perspective where it doesn't feel like fake commentary. It feels like, no, what yeah. what else is ninja going to say about what he's watching right i mean he's right, going to comment right. on what's going on with guy because that's what's relevant and that becomes a totally different pov on the action of the movie that you know if we were doing a movie about like baseball it'd be weird to cutting to a you know to cut to a fan at home saying oh you know you know reggie's gonna strike out here you know or whatever like it's just you know <laughs> yeah. that's not storytelling that would just be like augment augmentation but here it, it is a story point and and taika's character reacts every time those famous you know gamers <laughs> have something to say as you'll see in the movie there's a reaction to it from taika you know because he's the owns the game company so yeah because uh, i'd say so part cool. of like modern gaming like part of the storytelling of all these games is what happens outside of the game and so a lot of popular moments in games were with somebody streaming the game and creating a moment with the game also, so it was to me, this is like the first we're going to see something like this that's done as genuine as it is. That's awesome. Yeah. How, how do you guys feel now? I mean, it's it's going to premiere next week. You've uh, been a, a part of this movie for a long time. Didn't it come out last year or something? Like that I, <laughs> I mean, It's finally going to be out there. How, how are you guys feeling as we're about to launch into this? Mike? Uh, I just say it, it feels it feels 
awesome for me because this is the something where I felt like I had a pretty significant impact. I'll go into things and throw a lot of ideas down or why something doesn't work, or whatever. And I just feel like it's just a little bit of like, you know, they'll, they'll listen and then they'll go run off and do something totally different. Zach, it's just easy. I, I came in, I just say these things and he just understood it all. And then things that, you know, wouldn't work for the story. Not only that, I felt like I was learning from him because he would say why it's one thing to say, I'm not going to use it. He'd say why it didn't work. Mm. And so like for my growth on stuff for storytelling, everything like that, I was getting the best benefit because it's like, oh, not only is that, he's going back and tell me why that didn't work. And Sean did the same thing. I would kind of hold on something where I'm like, I, I think this is really, and he'd just say, well, here's why. And he would take the extra time to explain it. I felt, oh, this is awesome. I'm getting like the master class on why this works. <laughs> and now I get it too. And I think that. So that was amazing to me to, to finally have that come out, sit with other people and see this and finally see it with others. And, and hopefully I think my world and, and people that I work with every day, I think they're going to enjoy it. And that's why that was my ultimate goal. Cause the representation that they have in movies to date has always been really lackluster. And I feel like this, sure. this is hitting it. Yeah. Um, I mean, for me, I've worked on a lot of movies and you know, the truth is it's really hard to make a good movie. You know, it's something yeah. I'm always telling my friends from home, like, you know, why was this movie bad? And it's like, why is everything bad? I mean, it's hard to make something good if it wasn't, yeah. you know, it's really hard. And a lot of times you work on a movie, you know, incredibly hard and it doesn't come out well, you know, anyway, for 10 different reasons. When I saw the first cut of Free Guy, Sean's first cut, I was like, wow, that was really good. I forgot I was watching something I worked on, honestly. Awesome. I, I, you know, I got caught up in the movie. And, you know, the only other time I've had that is on, I worked on the, first men in black as a as a onset rewriter when i was very young um and when i saw the first cut of that movie i was like wow that was really good and i don't i only worked on four or five movies at that point so but i knew enough to know that the first cut is usually terrible i mean when anything i've worked on when i watch <laughs> the first cut i'm just like oh my god a disaster uh, <laughs> so so from the first cut on this movie has always been really good, in my opinion. In fact, I just feel like I just I really, really love this movie. And it's and so does Ryan and so does Sean and so does everyone because wow. it came out. It it's greater than the sum of its parts, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, it really is. And you know, I wouldn't mislead you. You can go back through my Twitter feed and see what movies I was excited about and which ones I did not comment on. <laughs> and uh, for me you know, the fact that it got delayed by COVID and everything else, it actually hasn't affected me that much because I just feel like this is a good movie. I hope it does well. I hope it's not affected by COVID. I know people are going to like it. Like, yeah, I know, yeah. I told Sean at one point when, you know, everybody was, you know, obviously it's such a bummer to, to be working towards a release. It's kind of unprecedented. And then wonder, yeah. oh, our movie theater is going away. You know, yes. well, Will anyone see this the way it's meant to be seen? Because there are a lot of moments in this movie that you will, that are like big cheers from the audience. I've seen it with a number of audiences. There are a lot of moments like that. And, you know, the one thing I kept saying to him is, look, you got to, no matter what, this movie is going to, you know, three years from now, people are going to look back on this movie fondly. Five years from now, it's going to be considered, you know, people if they don't recognize it immediately they will eventually because you just know um it's been very heartening i can't say mm -hmm. uh it's been very heartening to read people's reactions because you know i sent sean you know he sent me some of the clips and i you know people's reactions to the screening and i said this is so weird they got exactly what we were going for that's what they like about the movie I, you know that's that right. doesn't happen that often you know, that's so um, great. I mean, even with Ready Player One, there's stuff in that movie that, you know, just just as a little bit of a sidebar, you know, when I saw that when we Ernie and I and Stephen, you know, came up with the shining sequence. And by the way, everyone, Adam Stockhouse and all the other people worked on the movie. I just thought this is going to blow people's minds. People are going to realize the crazy meta quality of the sequence that it's Steven Spielberg redoing Stanley Kubrick, one of his best friends and someone he loves and, and purposely pulling it down, you know, like kind of doing the opposite of, you know, geek, geek worship towards it. And it has so many different layers because it's also the movie is kind of about him, whether he knows it or not. Um, 
but you know, when it came out, I felt like a lot of people aren't getting, you know, a lot of people are just so caught up in it that they're not getting that or people who, you know, people who didn't like it, that I just felt like they're really missing the point of that, you know, of sequences like that. Right. Mm-hmm. And part of that's because it's just a jam packed movie. With it was a packed movie. Yes. Right. Yeah. But, yeah. but, but even on successful movies like that, there can be moments that you, you just feel like, Oh, I wish people had, I, I hope people catch this the next time they watch it. And I hope that they have that moment that I did at least when I saw it free guy so far, it's just like, you know, if I had a list of everything that I hope people would say about the movie, they've been saying it. So yeah, that's unless wonderful. they're all liars, I'm, I'm already, <laughs> I'm already. <laughs> uh, oh, guys, I cannot wait to see this movie. I, I see it next week and I'm so excited. Uh, but I have to tell you, this is a, a wonderful dream come true to have a, a creative from the film world and a creative from the video game world chat together about uh you know a shared experience but also a real mutual understanding and appreciation of each other's mediums like this and uh, i've wanted to do conversations like this for a long time so thank you very much for both being here and uh good luck with the the premiere of free guy and uh, maybe we can catch up again afterwards on a future podcast i would love that sounds great we're we both like to talk so we just, sure do. <laughs> if, there's a, if there's a topic you want to talk about that we know anything about, we'll be there. But uh, even if we only slightly know something about it, but, well, yeah, I'll definitely reach out again for sure. And and listen, I just want to say whether this is in the podcast or not, I appreciate it for the same reason, which is it's nice to be able to talk. Nobody wants to hear on the movie. Like if I said, oh, let me tell you about the discussion I had with Mike Micah, they'd be like, just what's the upshot? Where are the pages, you know, like (laughs) other than Sean, you know, uh, or Ryan, but, but uh, it's just nice to be able to talk about, I mean, everybody knows movies because you go to movies and most of us know video games because we play them, you know? And so it is, it's, it's great to be able to talk with people who have feet in both worlds, either Mm -hmm. because they're fans or because they work in them. Uh, to me, it's really satisfying because, you know, that's where some of the most interesting stuff happens, where you're exactly. you know, you're crossing between two things and the two worlds are informing each other. So I was, you know, when Mike brought it up, I was like, that's something I'd love to talk about, you know, far more yes. than, you know, gossip about making the movie, which, you know, that I, know. I sell, I sell that to the Inquirer. So, <laughs> and, and that, you know, to back that up a bit more, it's like, for me, it, it, it was, it's exactly that where working on this, and especially whenever I talk to Zach, almost every time I talk to Zach, it's, this always happens where I feel like there's this whole undiscovered country of unique angles and stories and things we can tap into that only comes yeah. up when you, when you merge these two worlds together that you haven't totally. seen before. And that's, that's where like, I think like when we're talking about free guy and the setting of free guy, that's why I think it's so fresh and unique is because we're going to see this for the first time represented on screen like this. And that uh, came out of these two worlds kind of colliding like that, which was and discussions. Exciting. It came out of discussions just like the one we just had. So. Yeah. And we're, and we're just at the beginning of it too, right? Like we we've had a number of these things that pull from games, but it's a varying degrees of success, but we're really just getting started with it. And it's interesting that technology is a part of that transition as well, right? Using video yeah. game tech to make movies, I think is going to facilitate so many stories that intersect like this, which is, I think Absolutely. it's wonderful. Yeah. Yep. Well, guys, right. it was a treat to have you both. And, and uh, thank you both so much. Thank you for watching and for listening. We'll see you soon. And until then, play forever. Play forever.